Our scripture reading this morning comes from John. The next time Jesus spoke to them, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me won't walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees said to him, you're testifying about yourself, so your testimony isn't valid. Jesus replied, even if I do testify about myself, my testimony is valid because I know where I came from and where I am going. But you know neither where I come from nor where I am going. You people judge by external things. I don't judge anyone at all. But even if I were to judge, my judgment would be true because I am not alone in it. The one who sent me joins in that judgment. Even in the law, it is written that it takes two witnesses for testimony to be admissible. Well, I bear witness about myself and my heavenly parent who sent me bears witness about me as well. They asked Jesus, where is this heavenly parent of yours? Jesus replied, you don't know me, nor do you know my heavenly parent. If you knew me, you would know my heavenly parent as well. Jesus spoke these words in front of the temple treasury. While he was teaching, no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Ancient words from our tradition for our present day understanding. Thank you for being here today. Uh, like Carol said, it's, it's just great to spend time and get to like scan and see the faces <coughs> or at least the names. Um, by the way, if you're new, I have a chronic cough that bothered me for years. Then I got rid of it and it popped back recently after my booster shot, but I, I do not have COVID. Um, don't worry about that. Um, what I want to talk today about is another one of the I am sayings. We've been looking at them from different angles. And I want to start sort of my memory of being a child. I wanted to see God so bad um, I could taste it. That may not sound like me uh, now, but um, when I was a kid, that just was more important than anything. And I, I uh, when I got to college, I fasted and I prayed and I, you know, did different, you know, the different religions of the world, trying to figure out something that would, um, uh, you know, make me feel that spiritual presence. I, as a kid, um, it's, it's embarrassing now, but as a kid, I remember doing one of my prayers was holding a rock at arm's length and letting it go and asking God just for one moment, show me that there's something there that I haven't been talking to nothingness all this time. And uh, I didn't realize that it, my idea of the sacred, what I've been taught in Sunday school, uh, had become a problem. That I was looking for God like you look for Waldo in the little cartoon books. Um, I'd been taught. Um, a reduced image of the sacred. The word God is a symbol of something. So it's a symbol of mystery. It's a symbol of vastness, of depth. But when you think of God as a person, as a being, um, that becomes a trap because now you're stuck in the world of space and time. And what the symbol is trying to give you is a sense of transcendence. There's something deeper. There's something uh, broader than my little life. Uh, but again, I was, I was taught an incredibly immature idea of God, and, and it trapped me. I couldn't find my way out of it, because once, once you're looking through these judgments that you've been taught, um, you, you can't find the leverage to get out of that. It was like a mousetrap. What we're looking at in this series of I Am sayings is what I think is a brilliant symbol intended to shatter any image that you have of the sacred. We forget that the second commandment 
is against worshiping our images of God. And Christianity is terribly bad about that, of, of trying to reduce God to a humanoid being. Um, you know, it's a, a human being, although it's invisible, it has no shape. We say it's everywhere. Um, doesn't sound like a human being to me. So if God has shape, then that's being stuck in space. If, um, if God does something in history, that's being reduced to time. So what I believe the symbol of God, as, as the Jewish people understood it, was uh, pointing beyond our senses into a sense of depth, into a sense of largeness, of interconnectedness. That's the, the symbol for me begins with the burning bush. This idea Moses is wondering, he's lost, he doesn't know what to do with his life. Um, <clears throat> and he walks along and he sees this bush that's burning. Now, I, I believe that it was an ordinary bush. I believe that what he had was a spiritual experience, what in the East is sometimes called enlightenment, where he realized that every being that's alive is, is on, in flame, it's burning. Life is a combustion. But there's something bigger than that, deeper than that happening through, through all of us. And the name that Moses heard in the burning bush was basically the verb to be. It gets translated, I am what I am. But um, the way I was taught in seminary was it's, it's sort of the, the verb to be that's reduced in a way where you don't know if it's I am, we are, we will be, he, she, it that it's um, this pulsing sense of life and of being. And you're not supposed to say that name. It's supposed to point you towards the mystery, but you're never supposed to think that you've somehow copyrighted, that you've, you've got this rigid concrete image of it. Because once we reduce this transcendent to our senses, we're lost. But who doesn't feel the need to try to do that. It's like, it just, it's so comforting to turn the sacred into something that you can hold in your hand or a, a being that you can touch or talk to. And there's nothing wrong with those images as long as they're leading us deeper. So what happened then after the Jewish text, between, before when the Christian text was written, there was a mystical form of Judaism and they came up with these wonderful, wonderful sayings, I am sayings. They were often tied to a female version of wisdom that was called Sophia. The texts had been converted into Greek from the Hebrew. And so a lot of the more Greek kind of ideas became something they would play with because you can't really understand a mystery. So you have to be playful in order to stay close to that kind of seething, pulsing something that we're talking about when we use this, the symbol God. When the Christian text was written, they, particularly John, lifted those sayings by Sophia and transformed them to um, what was called the Logos. And the I Am sayings were born, which is, again, the Greek translation of this Hebrew idea of, of a mystery that you cannot put into words. So when Jesus is talking, he's, the reason we're looking at all eight of the I am sayings is it doesn't reduce to any particular religious understanding. And when you study the religions of the world, you're going to have a much, much bigger Christianity than if you've only been taught, you know, the, the cultural religion of your own time. So, um, <coughs> <coughs> Jesus is usually a code. When you look at John, it looks like they're having a schoolyard spat where uh, the, the religious leaders are saying that Jesus has a demon or that uh, he's born illegitimately, that he doesn't know his parents are. And then it looks like he's just returning in kind and saying, well, your parents are of the devil and um, you know, you don't know where you came from. And I do. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't judge anybody, but you're, you judge by the senses. This sounds like a schoolyard fight. What I think we need to realize is John is doing something more like Plato did. He's doing a dialogue 
where the religious figures that he's using represent traditional, literal, magical religion. And Jesus represents transcendent, mystical, and universal understanding. That when he says, I am, and he's going to say it different ways. We've, we've seen once where he said, I'm like bread, which you don't see anybody saying, well, that means you can put butter on Jesus. Uh, he says, um, he's going to say today that, um, that, that the way is like light. And last week we looked at the strangest one of all, which is before Abraham was, I am which should tell you that this is not literal. This is poetry, but it's mystical poetry. So um, I think the point that Jesus is going to try to say here is, you think, he's saying to these religious people, you think you love God, but if you don't love me as the offspring of God, as the child of God, and the way he's saying it is son of God, but this, this represents everybody everywhere all the time, that if you can't love the children you can't really love the parent. I mean, mo most loving, balanced parents would rather you hate them and love the children than to, to love them and hate the, the children. And Jesus is saying, if you want to find the root of your being, the ground of your being, that which connects you to every other being um, in the universe, this is how you do it. So what he's doing is, is creating a kind of a, a theological diamond. And each facet um, reveals a different aspect of the enlightenment experience he's trying to get across, but they contradict each other because life doesn't fit in any theology or philosophy. Um, that's a spoiler alert. If you're just going into religion or philosophy school. Um, so what he's going to say in the argument, the, the theological people are thinking literally he is a mystic. Jewish person. And the, the mysticism of, of his day and the centuries before Christianity, he's, he's putting that, uh, at least John is, into this kind of poem. And he says in our, our passage today, our I, am, I, am, I am passage is, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's kind of interesting how John weaves things like life and light, and these kinds of things. There was a, a saying of the Sophia passages that says, the path of the righteous is like the morning sun, and righteous meant just. It didn't mean uh, moralistic. So let me read it like that. The path of the just is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter into the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. When we're, when we're lost in our sense judgments, we keep making the same mistakes over and over again, and we blame it on something else. We don't realize that we're, we're hurting ourselves in, in many ways. So this idea of light, <clears throat> particularly when, you, when it's not something that you can see, um, what John is trying to get across, I think, is that what what the sacred is symbolized by is not something you can see, but that by which you see. Um, yesterday, I was looking for my glasses. I don't know if this ever happened to you, but I finally realized I was wearing them as I'm looking. That's when we look for God um, and we forget the idea that we're talking about the source of our being. We're not talking about a being that you're going to find somewhere out in the world. But the source of our being, when we remember that, then we can see it all around us. So it, it's, you don't pull out your eyes so you can see how you see. In the same way, the symbol God is not an object that you're going to find in space and time. It's a symbol of that beyond and within space and time. So when you, when you realize that, you're going to see it everywhere. But until then, it it's, feels like darkness. One of the symbols that's here, I believe, in the mystery religions that we don't realize just in the English is when Jesus talks about the devil. Um, and again, this is John speaking for Jesus. <coughs> <coughs> but 
But in a lot of these mystical religions, the devil symbolized dualism. It, it represented um, seeing the world concretely without getting any, ever getting the large picture. The reason the symbol has cloven hooves and a pitchfork is it represents uh, dualism. The word little, literally means to cast in two. D-I-A, it means two. B-O-L, we get ball from it or ballistic. It means to throw something. So when our thought takes over and we lose our roots into nature, into life, into the cosmos, uh, we're lost in a certain way. And one of the things that leads us to our roots is th this sense of illumination. Jesus is saying that the source is like a light. You can't see it, but it still illumines your path because the wisdom represents the patterning of things. And one thing that has to be true is the universe consists of patterns. There may not be a brainiac sitting there planning everything, but the universe has mathematical patterns to it, principles to it. Um, and when you realize that those patterns are everywhere, they're like sort of the fingerprints of the sacred. I've said before, if you were in a Van Gogh painting, and you were looking for Van Gogh within that painting, you know, looking for the, the person Van Gogh, you'd be really lost. But as soon as you realize that everything there was an expression of Van Gogh, that would be very different. You'd see the fingerprints all over the painting. Uh, David, could you put up Starry Night? Thank you. You're, you're ahead of me. Um, this is Van Gogh's painting of the sky. Now, that's amazing to me. And I feel like whoever came up with the symbol of the burning bush was trying to say that, that they were touching, they were feeling something behind what they were experiencing sensually. They were experiencing something transcendent that spoke to them through that bush. And I think that's what um, Van Gogh is trying to communicate with the sky, with the flowers. He said, there's a beam in our eye that we can't see. They're, they're, in other words, saying sort of the same thing. There's a light by which we see that we can't see, but we can feel it. We can express it. When we're creative, the cosmic creativity comes out. And you look at those patterns. Um, I don't know if, if you remember when they first showed the clouds on, on Jupiter. That struck me incredibly uh, because it looked like something Van Gogh would have come up with. And there's some that are bluer that you, you, you just see. It's like the starry night with those swirls, those vortexes. In the ancient world, the word for parent, for father, meant the source of things. And in the Hermetic writings, it, that was both male and female and beyond either one of them. But it was that vortex out of which we come. We, we can't, it's like a black hole. You can't see into the source of your being, the ground of your being, but you can realize that you're an expression of that. And the symbol of that was the cup of that vortex. That's that those spirals that you're seeing all over Van Gogh's paintings and over this. This is um, a kind of uh, intuitive understanding that we are the expressions of that that we're looking for when we look for the, for the sacred. When Jesus held up the cup at communion, in this mystical language, if he was speaking that way, that, that represents that vortex. He said, whenever you drink from this cup, you'll never thirst again. And he's arguing with people and he says, I know where I'm coming from and where I'm going. You don't. And then he, he uses the image of a parent in that way. Another uh, picture <coughs> Paul Davis sent me of uh, bacteria. Um, even at that level, you see these spirals, these swirling kinds of things. And in chaos theory, there's this idea of the fractals, the patterns that are embedded. In, in, you know, they're not things in nature, but they're the, the nature of the world for these patterns to occur and, and to, to reoccur. Um, so <coughs> this is a lot of what, thank you, thank you, David. Uh, this is what a lot of the scripture, I believe, is trying to communicate with us. Listen to Psalm 19. 
It says the path, uh, that's the other one. Um, Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of God's hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. What Jesus is saying is if you want to know the source, then look at, look at the children, look at the expressions, look at the manifestations. If it, when, when Van Gogh said the way to know God is to love many things, I think that's sort of what Jesus is saying in this passage. The more you can love me, he was saying, the more you can understand the ground of your being. But that was also true of every being, not just Jesus. When Jesus is on the cross, he represents suffering people all over the world, all through time. It represents the brokenheartedness of love. Again, I come at this from world religions. And so um, I see this pattern all over the world. To this is from Taoism, which is a nature religion. They don't usually put um, this path. Tao means the way. Um, and it's a natural thing. It, it's the way of things um, in, in that religion. But in this particular poem, number 52, Latsu puts um, the same kind of parent imagery to help people understand the roots of their being. John begins off, in the beginning was the word. This poem begins, in the beginning was the way, was the Tao. There's a place in the Rig Veda that I love that says, uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was Om. So you see these patterns all over the world. And this one, it says, in the beginning was the way. All things issue from it. All things return to it. To find the origin, trace back the manifestations. When you recognize the children, you will find the mother. You will be free of sorrow. If you close your mind in judgments and traffic with desires, your heart will be troubled. If you keep your mind from judging and aren't led by the senses, your heart will find peace. Seeing into the darkness is clarity. Knowing how to yield is strength. Use your own light and return to the source of light. This is called practicing eternity. <clears throat> A lot of my youth was this tortured search for God. Again, I was looking for somebody like Waldo. Um, and I, I didn't have the background. I, I never ran across a religion that taught that, that God doesn't have to be a being. God can be the ground of being. And more than that, it can be the source out of which being comes, that mysterious source. Then you don't have to come up with images of it. Then you don't have to say it has a name. But you can also recognize it all around you. Um, when I was in my first year of, of college, I had an experience um, or an insight anyway, where, you know, I'd searched so passionately for God and I'm sitting there praying and I'm getting angry and, you know, you know, I'm, I'm doing all these wonderful things. Why aren't you showing yourself to me, God? And I think I was just so desperate. <coughs> my mind or whatever wisdom was in me spoke up, but it sounded like an external voice. And it said, I am everywhere. Ask instead why you can't see me. That was a transformative moment in my search. Um, I don't think that there was an external being necessarily saying that. I think that um, that insight was coming from the inside out. I am everywhere. Ask instead why you can't see me. We can't see God because what the symbol is talking about is that which helps us to see in the first place. And uh, we can't see um, the source of all beings, but when we love each of those beings, we see those fingerprints everywhere. We see that manifestation everywhere. We see it in Jesus, but we see it in Buddha. We see it in Lao Tse. We see it in all 
of the offspring, every person, every animal, every plant, every starry night. Um, the sacred isn't something we can see because it's transcendent. When we reduce it to our senses so that we can understand it, we get lost in our judgments. We fall into a mouse trap that's very hard to get out of. But if we remember where we're coming from, this mysterious something, if we remember we were living in that, if we remember to that we were turned, then we can see wisdom's fingerprints everywhere. Well, this is my understanding of our story today. Uh, we'll take a minute now for you to contemplate on how you would understand it in your own words.